Lawan, who is going to talk about music in Indonesia, and we are very fortunate to have also the author of the book, Ajahn Sukri, in the back. I don't spell your own name because for sure it's going to be quite difficult. So my name is Lias Shostino, I am the founder of C Junction, and C Junction is basically the place that you see here, it's a small venue based at PSC that focuses on Southeast Asia. Normally you can come here and read books about Southeast Asia, it's a reading room, but then we have also series of different kinds of events. This, uh, last week alone we had a movie on refugees in Indonesia and then about the criminalization of drugs uh, in Southeast Asia, utopia or reality, considering the context of the region, and today about music. So as you see, it's very varied, both the challenges as well as the richness of the region. And today is about the richness of the region and particularly the music of this region. So without further introduction, I am very glad that Rawan is here. It's an old friend, Anthony, and, uh, but she, I think many of you already know her. Uh, she is director, movie director, and also researcher, and in this case, it's more about the researchers she has contributed to about this. So please, Rawan. Which is 
uh, a project research by Dr. Supreme Johnson, the founder of the College of Music Mahidon University. And uh, this project is aimed to look at what is the traditional music today and how it's going to survive the digital era with the country that uh, surrounds Thailand. What we're looking at is the, the new generation of musicians, how they encompass the traditional music or the instrument that exists in that country. We found also that uh, today traditional music is something that young people said that they don't care about it. They felt that it's so far away from their lifestyle. And they feel like uh, the digital era is something that uh, they like something that dynamic and fast beat. And Another thing is that the pop culture is always remain in whatever culture. We research and we find out that the singing contest in TV or singing shows is everywhere in every country. Next, we want to show you that uh, what is happening in each country. Let's go with the next group. Thank you. 
types of pumps of PSP for the development of the country. And uh, the size of the audience and the people who attend concerts is no longer exist in Myanmar, let's say. I also said that because the way the system working, like the marketing of the music, no, marketing of the products. So the owner of the product, like merchandise, like uh, water bottles, telephone, will hire the artist and then have them perform the concert without having any ticket. So people will come and feel like, okay, artists are so free. And that is the situation that happened in Rao and in Thailand as well. In Myanmar, also the CD and DVD, he said that his music because of people both young, because of the beat that really hip hop, and because of the side by the traditional Myanmar orchestra is popular among the whole. So he said that I went everywhere and people turn on my music. But you know, I only sell like two or three thousand, a couple thousand copies only. There must be like millions of copies out there. But he said that he didn't earn anything. And he said that today they're not even by the CD or the copy one. They just download it from the computer. So that is what he said that I am an artist, I cannot survive, you know. And he said that he do like business instead, like he opened a fabric shop and right now he doing like a sell food online, he said, in order for himself to support his uh, music work. Uh, during the um, 20 years ago, um, the military government opened the uh, university that teach music college. And uh, this music college now has uh, start to produce students. In the beginning, they only teach like um, traditional music and has no major. But this day, they have students who have like a major in uh, different, uh, okay, sorry, I skipped this. This is one of the finest harpists in Burma. Uh, she is the first uh, doctor of art in musicology in Myanmar. And she got her education in Japan. All of the artists, the musicians that we interview in this book, all got the higher education in music outside of Myanmar. And uh, she said that, you know, traditional music for young people, why her students just like not used to this? It is only because they never get the whole of it. They don't get a chance to listen to it. And like for herself, she wants to hold a concert, but she said that nobody support. And the cost, the main cost for her is the cost to get the stress because she said that you cannot sell ticket because it's kind of concert, nobody is going to pay a ticket. So you have to have a free concert for like a traditional music. And the next I want to show you, uh, this is one of the uh, top film score uh, musician named Diamo. He also teach at the uh, NUAC as well. One of the projects that he did is uh, very interesting. Uh, besides, uh, this one he's uh, doing what they call like find the uh, tuning system, the music pitch. Uh, I cannot accept too much. <laughs> you can ask that to be obvious. He said that because Burma has been exposed by uh, Western music, Western culture during the colonization, the UK uh, colonized Burma, and that uh, the piano has a tuning system that very close to the pentatonic uh, scales of Burma song. That musicians just love, you know, to tune the, the, the instrument to the piano, and at the end, the original sounds of the musical instrument just get lost. So one of his projects is like trying to find the original sounds. And the other project that he did, and he said it is very ambitious, is to re-record 
1,000 songs of uh, Burmese song from uh, 17th century onwards and to re-record with like uh, instrument so he will invite a professional master in the field and have a sound engineer and have an orchestra to re-record this as an archive. Uh, up until I think this year, he already done like about like 600 uh, songs. And he said that it's a very, very big project. And he just like asked me, do you know how to find the money to support this project? He also holds this, uh, and this is a project of record with all this stuff. And this is his staff engineer who is in Japan. He himself also got uh, master degree from Japan, from the Gendai. At his university, he said that how to make the young people interested in the traditional music. He said part of it is that you need to have them perform. And this, every year he will have an uh, orchestra at the National Theater, which is like a, a sell ticket uh, performance. And he will just like put all together an orchestra with traditional music, with jazz big band, with chorus, and with like a uh, string orchestra. And so next I'm going to have you listen to the project of his group.
this is Malaysia. And uh, the artist you just saw, the woman artist, is the diva in Malaysia and Indonesia, the uh, city Nohawisa. She actually is a pop singer, but she also uh, produced uh, a few albums that entirely is uh, traditional songs. With in Malaysia, not like this, so people not fancy about it. But uh, when Adiwa get into the traditional music, she really elevated the whole scenes of traditional music. And this type of music that they do, they call Irima Malaysia, which is basically just use the original uh, traditional tune and rearrange it with the pop uh, music. The person who do this Irama or called the father of Irama music is called Pangan, the guy uh, uh, who play accordions. And actually he himself, he didn't like the word Irama. He said, oh, I just do pop traditional. Uh, why are you call anything else? And he said that, that because of the status of the uh, city, it has helped the whole thing become phenomenal. They said that when they have a concert, that uh, she showed the uh, the whole uh, the whole concert traditional music is Irmadeng, the National Theater or the Istana Budaya earned the largest, like I think the highest uh, income in their history with the three day concert, and they have to extend it to four day, and that helped the uh, traditional music scene. And the back up the before actually in the, the video clip is by this called uh, traditional uh, music, uh, Malaysia traditional music orchestra, which is basically is like a gathering of like world music uh, in the orchestra because Malaysia is if you. Uh, you know, the history is in the one-time trading uh, era, you know, people just come to Malacca, which is at the Malacca Peninsula, and come with them as all these instruments that still left behind, not only in Malaysia, in Myanmar, in Thailand, in Cambodia, in Vietnam, in Indonesia, all got all these like a uh, instrument that travel from uh, this group of like a maritime trade. And Malaysia just started this with the infamous uh, project, the One Asia, and with this uh, orchestra, and try to uh, put together all the instrument, whether it's a Malay culture, it's a Indian culture, it's a Chinese culture, or the uh, Borneo's uh, area culture. And um, one thing that we find out is that with this whole influence of the old time maritime trade, Malaysia has a form of like folk dance and uh, rhythms, and they're very good at percussion. There's a lot of like uh, percussive band in Malaysia, and uh, this this one is uh, by this uh, group called Hands Percussion, and they do is like a 20 anniversary. Not not the first one. The first one is from the Tamil yeah, India in Malaysia. So this is like a Chinese type of percussion. This is uh, the set of uh, gamelan, they call like a chakyampong. And this is like a, the big uh, Chinese drum, Western drum. And this is in the, they call like rebana. So. This is a typical like um, music band that you will see when you go to maybe uh, weddings or any gathering. Like this one is doing the fast, like in the evening of the fast, and then is doing this kind of music. In Malaysia, the music is something that uh, get into. You no, know, I think that is have to not get into. Politics and uh, the 
international uh, culture policy has a lot to do with the music in Malaysia because of this whole um, national identity of being Malay and being Islam. And for the past, like, when, uh, more than 10 years or more than that, there also is what they call like consider an Islam or the purify of Islam that uh, has affect a lot in terms of like traditional music and tradition in music that has been in Malaysia. Anyway, that is one type of music that uh, I want you to listen to. It's uh, called Kasal. Uh, more like dynamic uh, 
the songs. Next we go to Lao. Uh, I don't have a grip for Lao, uh, but uh, in Lao, the past uh, 10 years, after uh, it opened up to uh, other country, because before Lao just closed and connect only with the uh, country among uh, the circuits of like a, what, what they call like a Soviet bloc and especially with Vietnam. But after the open of the country, they just like really embraced the uh, culture of world music in the sense of pop music. And so that is genre that come up, they call like Lao Bok. And so this is like the top Lao Bok musician. And what is Lao Bok musician? This is just like the influence of this K-pop, the Korea pop, Japan pop, and of course, Thai pop. Uh, when I asked this, uh, this guy, uh, Siam, also a singer, a pop singer, he also a very good sound engineer. He said that when you listen to the loud pop music, if you just take out the lyrics, you can't tell that it's a loud song. And that is his explanation. And he said that the uh, musician in Lao really can't say that they are musician because they cannot survive. There's not really a music business because the business is very small. And so said that most of the musicians or singer, in most cases singers, they just have to do that. They have to have their main job and do music as like kind of like a part of their life or like uh, kind of like being a celeb as a musician. Otherwise, it just like not really exist as a music business in Wow. The country has one uh, national school for music, which also like a follow uh, the structure more or less of Vietnam. And so they train students mostly for like uh, classical music. And also they have a traditional music course and it is focused on uh, the pen, the bamboo pen pie, which is like, they consider it's like a national instrument of Lao. The, this is, uh, you may feel like common, but in Lao, it just the past less than 10 years just reintroduced back to the Lao society because it's considered as like a court music. And so it's just recently like uh, introduced back to Lao. Okay, let's go next. Because part of it is that the setup of Vietnam uh, 
after the unification is they have this conservatory that the uh, model after the Soviet Russia. So people there have at least 10, the, the people who are, the student who apply in the conservatory has at least 10 years of education of music. And that's why there's a lot of, lot of like, uh, not like the musician that we interview or has a form of music education. And what makes the difference in this case is that once they have a very good foundation, they experiment more. And that is what we found out uh, in uh, terms of the music in Vietnam. Let's go to another.
when he wrote his piece, he intended to use like 35 kinds of uh, Cambodian traditional instrument in this piece. And because of the situation in Cambodia after the Khmer Rouge giant is that the music community has been wiped out. So for the past 20 years, the situation with the music society is to rebuild, uh, personnel rebuild people with the music education, introduce uh, instrument, and with this whole process, is make them also reconstruct the music like you saw the uh, twin gongs and also the double deck uh, xylophone. And uh, they also reintroduce, uh, reconstruct this. You saw the harp. It happens exist in Cambodia for at least 100 years or more. And with this process of uh, reconstruct the whole music community. They also like reconstruct new instrument. And he has used his, uh, he has write the new piece called Bang Skull, which right now is touring the world. And I think that next year is going to perform in Cambodia, which is a process also to, Bang Skull is a kind of like requiem to, uh, is a passage to send the dead to the heaven with music. And the organization that commissioned the two pieces that we uh, just uh, heard is the Cambodia Living Arts, which is held, uh, which is found by this guy, uh, Charles Soldier, uh, and John Paul who come back to Cambodia to help rebuild the whole music communities by start to find all these old master and start classes. And one other project, this is also uh, the musician that uh, he has searched and have asked him to run the classes and he has been honored uh, in a very high level by the government. To show. The other project that the Cambodia Living Arts have been doing.
music instrument uh, construction, that we structure construction. And uh, the first person he teach is also his uh, daughter to learn how to do the harp. So we're going to jump right to Thailand. <laughs> Thailand. Uh, in Thailand, uh, people probably look at the traditional music as is classical music. But uh, Dr. Zubri himself insists that for him, he thinks that the Molang Jongla is more of the music of the people, the music that has a dynamic and open to changes, you know. And so he focused uh, the whole chapter into the Molang culture of music. Molang in Thai has many incarnations because it's age old as same as the bamboo pie and those probably like the bar cultures of 1,000 years. In Thai, the popular reincarnation is in this what they call a Bluetooth Molang, it's a big band. It's no longer more of the music or the singing, it's more of the extravaganzas of the whole troupe and the stage and the dance and the concert. But this day with the digital technology, uh, not knowing what right I the uh, band leader of this Siang Isam, Luktuk Molam, also wondered that how she going to survive with this. She said that in her high time, she used to have like 50,000 audience. She said that today, if I got 2,000, it's fair enough. And so with that type of change, she said that I don't know whether how to survive, but at least this is their 43 years of existence that they still dwell in the country. Next we have Lassani that we just heard. Um, uh, let's go to a short break.
Sudan got Molan International Band. It's a very long name. <laughs> The one that the uh, concert that you saw as a guest and very is like way before Thai people are aware of this band. It took them like this uh, that three or four years before they got a high kick in Bangkok because nobody cared about their music and nobody knew about their existence. The combination of the band is very interesting with the lead sounds of this Molang accompaniment, the pin, and the, the pin is a Thai electric guitar, and the bamboo pipe, the band, uh, the can. With that, the rest is like two DJs, one Thai, one uh, British, and then uh, two young uh, pop musicians. I remember I talked talk to the, uh, the pin, the Thai electric guitar, he said, uh, you know, I never understand the music that we play because it's, it's in Molam. But I have faith in Mapsai, the, uh, the guy with the black glasses, because this is a guy who got educated in England but loved Molam music so much. And he made the young people, the young people, like the music. So that helped. But this type of band still have problem that they can't get enough get in Bangkok or in Thailand and they have to like get into festival abroad so that they can uh, get exposure. One uh, sad story I heard from them is that they said that well since we have been in many uh, famous festivals around the world it's like we promote Thailand in a sense so they just went to the uh, cultural promotion department uh, at the Cultural Ministry of Thailand asked for sponsorship. So this is what they tell me. The Director General just simply tell them that, oh, you not look like Thai. How can you represent Thailand? <laughs> and I'm, I'm really shocked when I heard them tell me this story. But this is a situation of people who do music in Thailand. The last that we're going to close the session is the, the next band called Asia 7. This type of combination isn't new, you know, with Thai instrument and then uh, with the jazz band or something like that. But what I see in this is that this is a group of new generation who got formal music education and put into the College of Music, Mahidon University. They all can create their own music. This is very important in Thai music society because most of the musicians, they cannot create their own original music and have to depend on whoever a songwriter or something like this. So being a musician, trained musician, just help them to be able to create new and different work. And because they are young generation, you know, they, Digital media or digital technology is an extension of their life. They know the rule that once they get into the music, create the new music, they can just have to promote themselves, sell themselves, put it online, and put everything, you know, to those YouTube thing. So this is uh, how I'm going to close the session.
for the Q&A sessions, uh, may I invite Dr. Sufriji and Mr. Pora to help in all the questions. <laughs> Maybe you want to make some comments first? No? Okay, so then we open immediately the floor for three questions first and comments or reflection. Okay, please introduce yourself and then... I'm, I'm John Cluley, I write the uh, Will Be column in the Bangkok Post. I wanted to ask you uh, about why, this, uh, or whether you knew bands like Samba Sunda from Indonesia, Dr. Grace Nono from the Philippines, because they were doing some of the things you've highlighted plus and me 20 years earlier. So maybe the first world music label in the whole of Southeast Asia, was the Philippines, Power Music, I think 1993. And that was a mixing of traditional styles with modern music. So the first one was Grace Nono. The second one was Joey Ayala in Indonesia, in West Java, Sunda. You have, in my view, the most successful band taking traditional music and blending it with outside sources, which is a band called Samba Sunda. Are you familiar with any of these groups? Well, let me uh, give you this explanation. The project uh, started out uh, focused on uh, mainland uh, Southeast Asia. Wow. So the country that does allow Thailand, basically. So we haven't touched, because we divide it into a mainland uh, ASEAN or Southeast Asia and the Icelandic uh, Southeast Asia. So we haven't touched that. We hope we want to. It's in the pipeline, but the uh, money is that uh, we get problems in the research project. Yes. And, and also, uh, the mainland uh, of South Asia around Thailand uh, also is colonized by, by the Western compared to Philippines and Indonesia, they occupied by Dutch and you know, many, many hundred years of course. But on this area, uh, Thailand never occupied. And I believe that the music in the center of South Asia still raw and still working more compared to, to Georgia. Dutch took Indonesian music and they opened, uh, they call ethnomusicology for a long, long time. So uh, uh, we focus study in, in mainland first and maybe in the future, a few years from now, we will do that. Thank Hi, my name is Gerald Huang from Chulangwan University. I'm not really expert, I mean, not knowing anything about music, but then it's very interesting to, to learn um, from your presentation. At the, at the beginning, you said that this traditional music is very marginalized because it's encountered with the pop music, right, that the young people like to listen. And then along your presentation, I can see that actually it's a reappear of the traditional music through the, it's a kind of like a, a little bit national project, right? Because this music is represent the, the national identity of each country, like in Burma or in, um, in Malaysia. Like, my question to you is like, um, how, how about the local music that um, with the folk song or with the local people who, who produce it? Like, who's their audience and then how they survive? Or how, how could you see this clash of political identity that the, the, the government wants to promote the national music, but that they think that it's supposed to be national instead of the local music that the people want to, want to play and want to keep it alone to survive? Okay, one more question, and then there is, okay, yes. Uh, I have Japanese. I remember the, the movie, uh, Obacha, uh, English title, Obacha, a uh, Thai movie, uh, about the uh, prayer or prayer of uh, Rano. Uh, I, I like, I love this uh, music uh, films. 
and I saw in Japan, um, and the Japanese title is Kaze no Zen Soto. Hi, uh, uh, what uh, other movies uh, do you uh, recommend? Um, or do you recommend uh, a semi documentary or, or uh, a, a film um, about music, traditional music? If you know, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Nice presentation. Thank you for coming. Actually, I'm a filmmaker, but I cannot think from the top of my head right now with the film. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Uh, I have, I have uh, a film he might want to see. Oh yeah, Mr. John Cooley uh, can recommend you. There is a, a, um, on the internet. Oh, sorry. If you you look on the internet, Jeremy Ma, a BBC documentary filmmaker, made a series uh, in the mid '80s called Beats of the Heart. And he did a program on Thailand which includes looking at Moham, Lukto, the King's music, called Two Faces of Thailand. Okay, um, I will try to see if I can answer that question. Um, we have, when you talk about local folk and national music, I have to admit that. Uh, we, our work, uh, teamwork, we is very confused with this whole how to define, you know. And you can see in each country, you know, uh, like in Malaysia, are you calling violin uh, music from other culture? No, but then it's been there for like 100, 500,000 years already. So um, it's hard to say that, okay, to draw a very clear line that this is local, this is full. But what we're trying to do is that today, what are people doing with those type of music? Like for example, if you call like Molam as a local tradition, it is. And it's those music that people also look down upon still. Uh, we call that local. And uh, the way people are doing is reinvented to be, uh, well, you're going to say the contemporary Molam or Molam fusion, or like the Paradise Bangkok, they call themselves Molam of the 21st century. So I think that that, that is dependent on how. But with this whole process, I think it is how extend the life of all this local tradition, local tune, and uh, whether it's going to be a positive or negative, I don't know, but I think that music is a kind of thing that evolves, it moves, it change, it's mixed and it's transferred from one culture to another. And uh, the local, it may, that the one that you mentioned is that, you have to say that traditional music always go together with ritual. And that part of music uh, has reduced its function with our modern life. Because now we have what we call music for listening. And I think that uh, what I present is focused more on music for listening. But uh, when you talk about local or tradition, those may be the music that accompany ritual. And that's still there. But uh, it's a music for what we call like a functional music rather than music for art, music for listening. Maybe I want to comment on the Philippines and Indonesia a little bit. One, I happen to know both the two people you mentioned as well as the group in Indonesia. I think Indonesia deserves a book on its own, actually, because <laughs> there are so many, and you may be aware of Jaduk Ferrianto and many other people who indeed get inspiration from oh, you music. Joseph, even yeah. Jose Maceda. Yeah, so there are so many that indeed is, uh, and there is the tradition is still also alive and well. Because the Rebana and this music combined with this 
Islamic tradition is also very much alive. So that would be very interesting indeed as a case study. The case of the Philippines, I think, is a little bit different in many regards. You may agree or disagree, because there is always the problem of what is local and what is not local in the Philippines. is very much a recreation of and Spanish colonization has done a lot to destroy a lot of the indigenous or whatever we want to. So indeed, both people are trying to search and combine from different locals, but they remain often in, in certain circles. I am not sure they get the masses. That well, I, would, I was thinking more of uh, people in Tivoli and Mindanao. Uh, they've been recording and putting out albums. It's part of the Philippines again, yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, I think the idea that there isn't traditional music in the Philippines or in Indonesia that might be more here, I think it's really hard to gauge. Really I think it's different. I also think the, yeah, you have to talk about what is authentic too, because that is an issue that comes into as well. Yeah, and I think Philippines is struggling a lot. Could I, could I, could I just add a comment about the, the tradition and so on? And what, what we saw here were a lot of um, state uh, music which was supported through universities or... And, and really, it, there's a lot of experiments outside of that, outside of Rasa Um You remember Boy Time from a long time ago, some of you. Maybe some of you remember Cancer Dam from Thailand, you remember? So these were early 90s experiments with jazz and traditional music and how you might do that. So um, I have to go back a long, actually quite a long way. Yeah, uh, we, we did talk to a member of Boy Town and also what he's uh, saying is that yeah, it's so hard for them to get the chance to perform and uh, there's a tour, so there isn't someone who come up and then create the new pieces for them and that's the situation. And that comes to another key element in our project is that we also looking at musicians who have a career path. Because there's a, a lot of like happening in music, in traditional music, or the experimental or the fusion. And so we try to look at the group that uh, exists today and still survive, and hopefully they can go on and survive. So for Afghanistan and uh, what Thai, anyone know is a kind of called Thai fusion. You know, after after those whole big picture class of Phong Nam, the Thai traditional uh, that uh, Bruce Gaston, uh, the American uh, musician who now a Thai, um, has the I don't know the word revives or. Um, what would he do? But that that is a big influence, and then follow from that is Boy Thai Gang Sadan Go Pai. And I think that a part part of the Asia Seven is is also like extend from that too. But as I said, is uh, more like we also look at the career path too. That they have the career path, and uh, they produce work, and their work is available at the moment. Okay, uh, give a chance if there is any very urgent comment or question. If no, we... You sure? No comment? No? But anyway, the book is outside, unfortunately only in Thai, so for me it's not really possible to read it. But for those who care in Thai, please buy and maybe Adan Sukri can sign it, no one can sign it. It would be nice for your collection. And there is coffee and tea outside, so please continue the conversation and uh, please give a donation on your way out.